that will be said this morning. נא להיכנס לשבת. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my, my great privilege, it's an honor uh, to introduce to you uh, Professor Hilary Putnam, uh, Kogan Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at Harvard, visiting professor at Tel Aviv University, uh, one of the leading important thinkers of the 20th and now the 21st century. Um, Putnam's work in, in mathematics he is known as having been instrumental in showing the unsolvability of Hilbert's 10th problem. In computer science, he's known for the Davis-Putnam algorithm. Um, and in philosophy, in philosophy, Hilary Putnam's combination of bold vision and uh, careful analysis has left an indelible mark on every area of contemporary philosophical thought. Um, the Quine Putnam indispensability thesis in the philosophy of mathematics, his recent views on mathematical existence, views on mathematical existence that he's tied to questions of uh, ethics without ontology. Uh, in metaphysics and philosophy of language, the causal theory of reference, semantic externalism, internal realism, and recently, Professor Putnam has turned his attention to Jewish philosophy. Uh, Putnam has contributed arguments and thought experiments that have become part of the philosophical canon. And indeed, things like Brains in a Vat and Twin Earth have crept into the popular culture. Putnam's work has spurred an industry, several industries, of uh, reading, of reaction, of criticism, and indeed, one of the most trenchant critics of Putnam's work is Hilary Putnam. Uh, I think that Hilary Putnam has taught us not only about philosophy, but how to do philosophy. Now in his 86th year, uh, the work doesn't stop, and neither does the recognition of that work. Uh, he has received a long list of prizes, honors, honorary degrees, one of which is an honorary degree from this university. Last year, he was awarded the Prometheus Prize for his impact on the philosophy of science. And just last month, he received from the Swedish Royal Academy the Rolf Schock Prize in philosophy, which is the philosophical equivalent of the Nobel Prize. It is fair to say that Hilary Putnam has taught us about how we think about the world and how to think about how we think about the world. That combination, indeed, is his topic today. Naive realism and qualia. Professor Putnam. If this were an Italian audience, I'd say senza far complimenti. Enough of the compliments. <laughs> But uh, I don't, there is no such expression in Hebrew, of course. <laughs> uh, 
In a, in a lecture I gave to the American Philosophical Association called 12 Philosophers and Their Influence on Me, I described how certain teachers and later certain things that I read and certain philosophical friendships that I had formed had an influence on the development of my philosophical views. Apart from Rorty, who I'm, I was very fond of, but whose impact I described as, quote, inspiring me to refute his account of pragmatism, unquote, all of those influences, all of the other influences were described in positive terms. Uh, if that lecture had to be given today rather than in 2007 as it was, a 13th philosopher would be added, Ned Block. And of course, in the Jewish tradition, 13 is not an unlucky number. 13 is the number of attributes of God. I learned from William James that the reason that the Christian superstition is that 13 is unlucky is that there were 13 at the Last Supper. So, so Jews who avoid the 13th floor of a hotel are really uh, behaving like Christians. Uh, <clears throat> the 13th philosopher, I would add, uh, it, w it would be Ned Block. And although John McDowell would still be on the list, I would not write today, as I did in 2007, that, quote, it is the disjunctivist school in the philosophy of perception that shows how it is possible to defend what William James called the natural realism of the common man. The reason for both of these counterfactual changes in my 2007 lecture is the same. Over a period of a couple of years, the impact of two papers by Ned Block over about a period of about two years, uh, a lecture of his titled Wittgenstein and Qualia that I heard Block deliver at the Putnam Fest conference in my honor in Dublin in March 2007, and a paper of his titled Consciousness, Accessibility, and the Mesh Between Psychology and Neuroscience that appeared later in the same year. You can find both of these papers, I believe, on his website at New York University. In the course of the last few years, these papers have had an impact on my thinking about the phenomenology of perception comparable to the impact on my later philosophy of mathematics that reading Quine's 1948 on what there is and 1951 two dogmas of empiricism in my when I was in my 20s turned out to have. The present essay is an impact and is an attempt to describe the impact of Bloch's work. This will appear in a festschrift for Ned, and it's actually half of this, it's really ended up being half on Bloch and half on McDowell. It's, so this first section, I'll read the section titles because I think to help to orient you, especially since there's no PowerPoint. The first section is called, Is Sameness Well Defined in the Case of Qualia? Bloch's paper, Wittgenstein and Qualia, did not immediately convince me, however, one of its theses I had already accepted, namely that the view, which I called externalism in the threefold chord, mind, body, and world, and by th this particular use of externalism I avoid now because I have a different use of externalism in philosophy of language, semantic externalism. And so I very rarely, but in mind, body, I refer to the view which is held bo both by disjunctivists and by some intentionalists, two big schools in philosophy of perception, that you can describe the subjective character of a veridical perceptual experience completely by just describing the objective perceptible properties of the thing or things you're looking at. So if I'm looking, uh, Mar Mike Martin likes to use a white picket fence in a paper called On Non Being Alienated. So if you're looking at a white picket fence to describe the subjective quality of that visual impression, it suffices to describe the objective color, et cetera, of the picket fence, or at least the objective color as it, as, as from that point in space. The objective look, so to speak, where the objective look is something that can be photographed, not, so, so th this is, uh, so these two schools, although they, they clash violently on other things, intentionalism and disjunctivism, uh, both t take the, what's 
what they, what they call the transparency of perception to a, a, a really far out extreme. Perception is so transparent that in the case of veridical experience, they have different stories about hallucination, but in the case of veridical experience, they both insist what you see are the properties of the thing itself. It really is, deserves the term naive realism. Uh, now, in, I had already accepted, before I heard Bloch's talk, one of the theses uh, of the Bloch defense, namely that this extreme externalism is wrong. Uh, the, you cannot describe the phenom phenomenological character of a veridical perceptual experience, say the experience of someone has when seeing a white cat on a blue sofa, just by exhausting, exhaustively describing the relevant observable properties of the presented scene in public, in the usual public language. That is, describing the shade of blue of the sofa, the kind of white in the case of the cat, etc., uh, the kind of lighting, the distance you are from the sofa. Describing all those things is not to give a complete description of the phenomenological character of your visual experience. I've long maintained that the, the way the color of something appears to a subject depends on the properties of the perceiving subject as well as on the properties of the something in question. Uh, as a young man, and I maintain that because of an experience I had already as a quite young man. As a young man, I think this was at Atlantic City probably, I noticed that when I, when I would lie on a beach with one eye shut, as would occasionally happen when one side of my face was on the sand, and so I would close that eye, uh, the, be the beach, the color of the beach looked a slightly less intense shade of yellow if the left eye was open and if the right eye was the open eye. But I wouldn't have said that it appeared, the beach appeared to be yellow uh, when viewed with my left eye alone, and that appeared to be gray when viewed through my right eye alone. The difference was not that extreme. And I wouldn't have affected my matching performance on a color chart. Suppose I had a car chart with all the different objective shades of yellow, labeled yellow one, yellow two, and so on. If the, if the beach seemed to me to match yellow 32, when I look at both the color chart and the beach with my left eye open, it would also seem to match yellow 32 when I look at the color chart and the beach with just my right eye open. It's the, it's the subjective appearance of the objective color that is different. Uh, the difference in, uh, between these two experiences is ineffable in Bloch's sense. That is, Bloch is not, by ineffable, Bloch doesn't mean impossible in principle to describe. Maybe you could describe it using some scientific language or some scientific theory, but it's not describable in ordinary public language, ordinary public color talk. But it's not in, in, inexplicable, as Bloch mentions, this, this phenomenon is easily accounted for by the difference in, the, and he refers to me as the one who pointed his attention to it, but it's accounted for by the difference in the maculae of the two eye. The maculae of my left eye, and, the, no, and by the way, everyone else I've had suggest, tried, talked to and had tried the experiment, say, of looking, go, looking at a surface, say, outside, looking at a white, white wall, say, 20 or 30 years, far enough away from you so you can't account for the difference by uh, parallax. You look at, a, say, a, a white wall or a yellow wall, uniformly colored wall, with your left eye open, your white eye and right eye open, and just everybody will report that the subjective appearance of the color is a little different. And you can't say, well, the real color is the color it would appear to have to someone with a normal macula. With a norm, because the, the, both my right, both my right eye, the macula of my right eye and my macula of my left eye are in the normal range. It's not even an abnormality. To a, but to ask, is the shade of is the sand really the shade it looks to your left eye or the shade it looks to your right eye is meaningless. So there is such a thing as going, I agree with the program of trying to say what was right in the in naive realism, or in what I'd prefer uh, 
James' expression, the natural realism of the common man, yes, we should try to say what was right in that, but there's such a thing as going too far in the direction of naive realism. However, at the Dublin conference, I still rejected the idea, which is central to Bloch's defense of qualia talk against Wittgensteinians, that the relation of sameness of qualitative character could be fixed by finding out which brain states qualia correspond to, or which brain states they are. There I said, quotes, in the this is in the discussion, but that discussion will be published shortly because those papers are finally coming out in a volume that Maria Begramian is editing. I said, quotes, uh, now, Bloch's paper certainly suggests that some straightforward identification of qualia with certain brain states is going to be discovered. But if there were such an identification, maybe I should say if there were such an identity, knowing which one it is is probably an unsolvable epistemological problem. And I give an argument that it would be, that if there were brain quali, if the brain state quali identity, it would be epistemologically unknowable. I give an argument to that effect in the mind-brain chapter of Reason, Truth, and History gave. Now, <clears throat> and I could also have referred to the threefold chord, mind, body, and world, because in that book, written, uh, I, although it, that book rejected the internal realism that I defended in Reason, Truth, and History, it also rejected qualia talk on the grounds that sameness and difference of subjective experiences is something for which there are only ordinary language criteria. Uh, in other words, a fully competent speaker, if a fully competent, I defend the view that if a fully competent speaker of the language says her experience was the same on two occasions, then other things being equal, it, that counts as it's being the same. The question as to whether the experiences of different people or even one person at different times are really the same when there's no basis for doubt in the ordinary use of the expression same experience, could I claim not be scientifically investigated? There is, as I put it, no well-defined relation of ph phenomenological sameness there for science to investigate. This claim of mine, that qualitative sameness, supposing there is such a thing, would be in epistemologically inaccessible was directly rebutted by Bloch in the second of the two papers to which I referred above, the one on the mesh between neuroscience and phenomenology and philosophy of perception. It's worth our time to review the issues at stake. Here's what a part of what I said in Dublin after Bloch delivered the first of the two papers, Wittgenstein and Qualia. I already quoted the first sentence. But if there were such an identification of qualia with brain states, knowing which one it is is a probably unsolvable epistemological problem. I think we should give up the assumption. This is the view I'm no longer, uh, Bloch talked me out of. I think we should give up the assumption that sameness of qualitative character is well defined even for one person at different times or different people at the same time let alone for non-conspecifics. Uh, even Bloch thinks it's problematic for non-conspecifics, say for a, a mammal and a fish. Uh, I don't think there is a fact of the matter, albeit an ineffable one, about whether the qualitative character is the same or different in such cases. I think we should give that, that assumption up. I think there are no good candidates in present-day neurology for a relation of identity of quantitative, qualitative character. If it seems strange that one can be wrong about there being a well-defined relation of identity here, an example from the history of science may help, I said. It naturally seems to us that there's a fact of the matter about what's happening somewhere 10 light years from here right now. When my kids were small and I, there were comic books lying around the house, Superman comic books, I noted how often you were told exactly what was happening in some galaxy 10 light years away or a hundred light years away, as if there is a fact of the matter as to what is 10 light years, what is now 10 light years away. But after special relativity, we've had to abandon that natural belief. 
We've learned that right now is not well defined when astronomical distances or high relative velocities are involved. Similarly, it may be that identical phenomenal quality is not well defined. Nagel's famous question, is the, is the bat, bat's phenomenal experience the same as mine or not, may be meaning, as meaningless as what is happening on the sun this second. At this point, I gave the following argument in support of the idea that the supposed relation of identity of phenomenal character of experiences of a subject at one subject at different times is, if it exists at all, epistemologically inaccessible. Gerald Edelman once invited me to spend a day in his laboratory. In the course of that fascinating visit, he said that when we visualize, say, a colored sheet of paper, Part of what happens is that part of the visual cort the part of the visual cortex that was active when the original experience occurred is reactivated. Suppose that the recognition of patterns, thinking of shades of colors as a species of pattern, in, uh, is modularized. Uh, Edelman also told me that pattern recognition modules tend to recruit additional neurons if they're frequently stimulated and to lose neurons to adjacent modules if unused compared to the adjacent modules. Consider the speculation that the slightest change, say the loss or gain of a single neuron, changes the quale. Could the subject tell? In philosophical investigations, Wittgenstein wrote, Quotes, always get rid of the idea, this is in uh, paragraph, page two, 207 of part two of Philosophical Investigations. Always get rid, of the idea of a, get rid of the idea of a private object in this way. Wittgenstein's proposed therapy. Always get rid of the idea of a private object in this way. Assume that it constantly changes but that you do not notice the changes because your memory constantly deceives you. It, when, what Edelman t told me, suggested me to me that if the changes Edelman described did cause a change in the qualia we supposedly have when a given module is stimulated, we would never know because when we had tried to remember how the sheet of pa paper or whatever looked before the neurons were added or subtracted, uh, from the module, the memory image would seem as if there were no change in the quality. That's exactly, in other words, that Wittgenstein's thought experiment is actually occurring all the time. Memories would change as the correlated qualia changed. And this shows that at the very least the supposed sameness or, of, sameness or difference of qualia is epistemologically inaccessible and perhaps at the very idea that there is such a relation, a relation of really being the same, as distinct from the relation of seeming the same as far as I can tell now by relying on my memory and my mastery of the language, is as much of a mistake as supposing that there's such a relation of as really happening this very second on the sun as opposed to happening this second in a given reference frame. Wittgenstein's and Edelman's remarks seem to fit together like hand and glove. Now the next section is titled Problems with my argument against qualia. Obviously I took a remark of Edelman's and ran with it and I probably ran further than he would approve. To conclude from the experiment with a colored sheet of paper he described that we can never remember what our experiences were like prior to changes in the visual cortex, as I did, was a big inferential leap. If someone becomes red-green colorblind as a result of brain damage, is it really the same case that she will not be able to remember what red and green objects look, used to look like? That's certainly not something I know, but there were fatal problems with my argument beyond the uncertainty of the empirical premise I assumed. Even if its premise were correct, that would show only that if a subject's spectrum became became shifted as a result of changes in her visual cortex, she would not be aware of it, and hence others could not confirm the shift on the basis of her reports. In consciousness accessibility and the mesh between psychology and neuroscience, 
Block argues that identification of the brain parameters responsible for qualia need not depend simply on subjects' reports. In general, mind-brain connections have to be confirmed by arguments from the consilience of a hypothesis with different kinds of evidence rather than from direct tests, a similar familiar from present-day physics as well. As well, uh, from present day physics, for example, as well as from a comparison of the explanatory power or lack thereof of various alternative hypotheses, as is common in other sciences. In consciousness, accessibility, and the mesh between psychology and neuroscience, Bloch outlines how such an approach is likely to go in the case of visual phenomenology. On studying that paper, I was completely convinced. As a byproduct of reading that paper, I was also enabled to see what was wrong with a key argument in J.M. Hinton's classic paper, Visual Experiences, the foundational paper for what is today called disjunctivism, that I had, an argument of, that I, of Hinton's that I had long found fishy. Hinton scoffs at the idea that someone has experiences which are the same when she has a hallucination and when she is, has a corresponding indistinguishable by her, visual experience. Now, of course, that's the shocking counterintuitive claim of disjunctivism. That is to say that even a perfect hallucination, say one, uh, and, and a course, corresponding visual experience do not have such things as common, there are no common sense data or common qualia. They're just indistinguishable. But to say they're indistinguishable because the sense data are the same or because the quality are the same is just a mistake. There are no such things as quality or sense data. Uh, call such a common factor, uh, Hinton says, let's suppose there were such a common factor, a common phenomenal factor, and call it her psying, using the Greek letter psi, her psying on both occasions. We could not find out what psying is by empirical investigation. In other words, there couldn't be a, a, uh, an identity theory, a, a physicalist identity theory, that the relation of psying is such and such a physical relation, counting neurology as part of physics. Hinton argues, because we would first have to be clear on what psying is. His picture is clearly that an empirical identity, say A's are really B's, can only be confirmed if one is totally clear in advance on what one means by A's. Here's the passage in the Hinton paper, Visual Experiences. Quotes, if there is no such thing as Q, the supposed common Q, the, as the supposed common factor, then there is of course no such thing as my psying for the following statements to be about. One, my psying is one and the same event as some happening that is describable in the language of physics and or physiology, including neurophysiology. The problem with Hinton's argument, in a nutshell, is that when an identity, A, A's are really B's, is a matter of theory. For example, say gravitational attraction is really a tidal force, that is a deformation of space-time rather than a simple observational report like that man is my son, becoming clear on what A means, what we mean by gravitational attraction, and confirming the claimed identity as the best explanation via the consilience of various lines of data, the fact that it has the highest explanatory power of all the proposed explanations and the like, pr pr proceed simultaneously. One does, becoming clear on what A's are and becoming clear and determining what the best identity theory is proceeds simultaneously. One does not come before the other. If qualia will be successfully identified with brain states, then we can expect to become clear on not exactly what we mean by qualia, but on what we ought to mean by the term. What we mean by water today is in fact not exactly what we meant before we discovered the chemistry of water. For Locke, ice and water were two different substances, albeit one frequently turned into the other. Uh, one of the reasons British atomists believe that alchemy should not be theoretically impossible is that after all, we do see one substance turn into a different substance whenever water freezes or ice melts. In 1967, 
Oxford Ordinary Language, which is when Hinton's paper was published, Oxford Ordinary Language philosophy was still riding high. The argument of Hinton's that I just quoted represents the weak side of that profoundly scientifically unsophisticated school. And the next section is called Naive Realism. Although the earliest source, if, if I would like to see it, I always thought there was an earlier source, but the earliest source I've been able to find for the phrase naive realism is a book of Russell's published in 1940. The idea that the mass of mankind are quite mistaken in thinking that the colors, textures, and other secondary properties of the objects they claim to perceive, uh, that, that the mass of mankind mistakenly think that the secondary properties of the objects they perceive are out there in the things themselves when they are really just our own sense data is an old idea, but calling that idea naive realism, I think, is Russell's invention. For Russell, it was already quite clear when he wrote The Problems of Philosophy in 1912, and still clear in 1940, after, even after a flirtation with direct realism in, his, in the analysis of mind, that we do not observe physical objects at all. He wrote, when in ordinary life we speak of the color of the table, this is the 1912 book, when in ordinary life we speak of the color of the table, we only mean the sort of cable color which, was, which it will seem to have to a normal spectator from an ordinary point of view under usual conditions of light. But the other colors which appear under other conditions have just as good a right to be considered real, and therefore to avoid favoritism, we are compelled to deny that in itself the table has any one particular color. And 10 pages later, about 10 pages later, because the problems of philosophy moves very fast, about 10 pages later, and brilliantly, Russell has shown to his satisfaction that the table we see lies in our own private visual space. Not just that the table we see doesn't have any one real color, but the table we see lies in our own private visual space, and the table we feel lies in own, our own private touch space, etc. Quotes, my ta knowledge of the table as a physical object, on the contrary, is not direct knowledge. Such as it is, it is obtained through acquaintance with the sense data that make up the appearance of the table. There is no state of mind in which we are directly aware of the table. All our knowledge of the table is really knowledge of truths, and the actual thing which is the table is not, strictly speaking, known to us at all. Finally, our, our knowledge of the table might, must be via inference, quotes, thus it becomes evident that the real table, if there is one, is not the same as what we immediately experience by sight or touch or hearing. The real table, if there is one, is not immediately known to us at all, but must be an inference from what is immediately known. Hence two very difficult questions at once arise. One, is there a real table at all? And two, if there is, what sort of object can it be? Nor is the Russell view wholly dated. Although philosophers who say that what we perceive are, are, are our own sense data are no longer thick on the ground, there are respected contemporary philosophers who deny that colors are real, Larry Hardin, for example. And if colors are not real, then much of what we take ourselves to see is not there to be seen. Moreover, a search of the internet under naive realism will reveal that quick refutations of naive realism, many of them two or th three centuries old, are all over the place. For example, if naive realism is to be taken seriously and colors are out there in the world, then apples regularly change color depending on how much light is around them. It is much more plausible, though, to think that the apples are the same as they ever were, that all that has changed is our experience of them. That refutation assumes that the naive realist can't maintain that dispositions to have certain appearances to human beings cannot be out there in the world. In fact, even naive realists would include dispositions to have a certain look depending on the lighting conditions and the position of the viewer as among the objective properties of the objects viewed. And today there are philosophers who are proud to call themselves realists, obvious, naive realists, Obviously, this new use represents a reaction against views like Russell's. And clearly, the externalism, in this sense of externalism, externalism as naive realism, uh, that I 
argued against above represents a sort of return to naive realism, as does my own call in the threefold chord for a second naivete in the philosophy of perception. But rather than try to survey all the contemporary views that represent more or less a defense of naive realism, what I shall do for a moment is look at Russell's position and see what points a defender of any degree of return to naive realism at what points a defender of any degree of return to naive realism might reject it. Um, in the above quotations from the problems of philosophy, the following propositions are obviously assumed to be true. One, we perceive our sense data, but the man and woman on the street mistakenly think that what they are perceiving are real physical things. Two, we don't actually perceive physical objects. Three, what we know about physical objects we know by inference. The premises for those inferences come from observing our own sense data. Now I will read just a little of the next section which is called Some Ways of Rejecting Russell's Picture. It's easy to find grounds for rejecting one, two, or all three of these Russellian propositions, but some ways of rejecting them hardly do justice to what William James called the natural realism of the ordinary person. Many of the ways of rejecting Russell's argument amount to little more than an appeal to ordinary language, ordinary usage. Not a bad thing when it's just one of a number of points made in a philosophical discussion, but hardly a satisfactory response by itself to a deeply thought out and complex metaphysical cum epistemological position such as Russell's. For example, one might say, we don't perceive visual sense data, we have them. And one might reject the second proposition by saying, when we have the appropriate visual sense data and we unconsciously and automatically infer that there's a table in front of us, then that's what we call seeing a table. That's what we call seeing a table. Obviously, this is not a rejection of Russell's metaphysical position at all, but simply a recommendation that Russellians find a way of expressing their view that's more charitable to ordinary ways of speaking. However, there are more substantive reasons that some philosophers would reject the idea that what we call seeing a physical object is actually inferring from our sense data. Uh, <clears throat> uh, although some of these grounds are, these, these more interesting grounds for rejecting that claim are also controversial. A widely held view today, for example, uh, that is that the justification of observational beliefs, at least about such fundamental sensible properties as color, shape, texture, and hardness, is what's called a reliabilist one. It's just that we've been, it's enough to say that we've been programmed by evolution, so when any one of those beliefs is caused by impacts on our sense organs, an, an event that reliabilists identify with perceiving the objects when the causal chain is of the right sort, the belief is very pr probable to be, is very likely to be correct. This reliabilist ground for rejecting uh, Russell's position, unlike the ordinary language grounds, does involve a serious disagreement with Russell's metaphysics. Today's naturalistic reliabilists, rightly in my view, see perception as beginning with external things and transactions involving both those things and the organism and not with sense data. That is a, sorry, Reliable is the right thing in seeing perception as beginning with transactions with external things and not as beginning with transactions with sense data. But it would be theoretically possible to produce a version of reliabilism more friendly to at least a part of Russell's picture, but I won't try to sketch that now. Uh, and another common ground for rejecting Russell's picture is the so-called transparency of perceptual experiences. That is the claim, the observation, which is really an observation about the phenomenology of perception, namely that when you try to focus on, say, the visual sense datum that you're having when you look at uh, any particular object and focus on its color, it doesn't seem to you that you're focusing on the sense datum. It always seems to you that you're see what you're focusing on is the physical object. G. Moore once wrote, the moment we try to fix our attention upon consciousness and see what distinctly it is, it seems to vanish. It seems that as we had before us a mere emptiness. When we, try to when, what we, when, when we try to introspect the sensation of blue, all we can see is the blue. The other element is, as it were, diaphanous. But, of course, 
any argument directly from phenomenology uh, to what the right metaphysics is, is itself problematic. Now, theories like Russell's are internalist picture theories in the sense that the inputs of perception, the sense data, like Hume's ideas and impressions, are entirely inside the subject's mind, according to these theories. And the mind is conceived of as either inside the brain, by materialists like Hans Reichenbach, my teacher and Ruth Anna's teacher, or, as, or the inputs are conceived of as totally immaterial by Berkeley and arguably by Hume as well. Russell's view seems to have been wavered, seems to have wavered between materialism and immaterialism over the years, depending on which of his books you look at. Such views represent what I called an interface conception in the threefold chord because they allow us no truly cognitive access to the world, at any rate, to the world outside the brain. But there's good reason for, no good reason for present day naturalist philosophy of mind to be internalist. In a way, this is something I already argued in The Meaning of Meaning. A central thesis of that essay was that we need an externalist and anti-individualist account of what it is to under understand the words of a natural language. To think about gold or water or grass or most of the things we think and talk about is to engage in an activity that presupposes complex interactions with our environment and with other people. In the meaning of meaning, I express this by saying that meanings aren't in the head. But as a number of people later pointed out, I should have said the mind isn't in the head. It's not, I hasten to add, that the mind is somewhere else, say in the lev. Uh, the mind isn't a thing with a location at all. So it is not simply the brain under another name, but a system of world-involving abilities and exercises of those abilities. This view is, I believe, now accepted by a majority of philosophers of mind and cognitive scientists. This is the view of the mind I've had for a long time. In the last few years, I have realized that it also captures what was right in functionalism. It's a true that I originally gave the name functionalism to an internalist view. In, the, in my functionalist paper, The Nature of Mental States, back about 1975, the mind was identified with the, with the brain, which was I, described as a computer. And our mental states were identified with computational states of that computer. That was wrong, but the idea that mental capacities and activities are ways of functioning was right, provided we allow that those ways of functioning may involve the environment and other people, and provided we do not limit the language used for the description of, <coughs> of those ways to the language of computer science. For that reason, uh, in my Prometheus lecture, to which Carl referred, I, I, I refer to my present position as liberal functionalism and to functional states as being liberal in this liberal sense as having long arms, arms that reach out to the environment. In this terminology, the meaning of meaning is a liberal functionalist view of cognition or an externalist view if we don't give externalist the sense of naive realist. I said above that an externalist conception of thinking in this sense of externalist is now widely accepted in cognitive science and philosophy of mind. But once this becomes the case, as it obviously had not in Russell's view, nothing stands in the way of, ex of extending externalism to perceptual states as well. But now a problem arises, and this is the problem, the point at which I turn to McDowell's views in mind and world. At, which were in, uh, where McDowell has a position diametrically opposed to blocks and to the whole idea of qualia that is of non-conceptual phenomenal characters common to both veridical and non-veridical experiences. To see the problem to which I just alluded, let's recall that McDowell motivates his complex chain of arguments in mind and world by laying down two requirements for a satisfactory philosophy of perception. The first, which he calls minimal empiricism, is that sensory impressions must be a tribunal before which our beliefs about the world can stand. And much of the con controversy connected with that book has to do with Mac McDowell's claim that this requirement can only be fulfilled if those impressions are themselves conceptualized. In other words, if, 
if you're not a total reliabilist about justification, if you think there's such a thing as having reason, good reason, to believe that P, and that's not always, and that's not always the same thing as having arrived at P by a method with a high probability of yielding truths. Uh, and by the way, there's a powerful argument against uh, extreme, uh, against um, reliabilism uh, uh, in Kripke, in Saul Kripke's, in one of the long, first long essays in Kripke's new collection of papers, which I just received a copy of. I mean, Kripke is a devastating on examples of how something might be arrived by a method which in fact has high probability of yielding true beliefs and not be justified and vice versa. He's an uh, no one is better at producing counterexamples than Saul Kripke. But secondly, if you believe that, in other words, that there is such a thing as justification in a traditional epistemological sense as having good reason, uh, and sec uh, then McDowell argues that uh, mi minimal empiricism requires that we require that qualia themselves, if there are such things, sense impressions, which he does believe in, that sense impressions themselves must be able to constitute good reason for beliefs about the external world. The second, which is supposed to follow from the first, is that uh, so reliabilism must be rejected. And then McDowell concludes, and this is really the gravamen of the whole of mind and world, is that in this demanding sense of justification, sense impressions can justify beliefs about the external world only if sense impressions, all sense impressions, are conceptualized. In opposition to McDowell's views, Hila Jacobson and I have argued, and she r read uh, this uh, uh, chapter of a book we're writing uh, with this argument here in Jerusalem at a conference a couple of weeks ago, Hila Jacobson and I have argued on both empirical and conceptual grounds that the phenomenal characters of perceptual experiences are not, or in, in, uh, or in any case, not always conceptualized in any of the senses McDowell has proposed. And if McDowell is right, it would follow they can't be a tribunal whether or not those phenomenal characters are identical with qualia. So McDonnell is right, McDowell were right, skepticism threatens us. Moreover, qualia block taught us are brain states and hence in, in, internalistically identifiable. We might of course say that having appropriate qualia only counts as perceiving something when they're caused in the right way. But didn't I criticize that account a moment ago? So it looks if we've handed game set and match to the skeptic and fallen back into Russell's pi picture or a physicalist variant of Russell's picture. My present view is almost the complete opposite of McDowell's, and I have to skip now some things, where McDowell requires that impressions must be a tribunal. I have argued uh, that it's apperceptions and seeming apperceptions, reviving an old term as old as Kant, but once still around in psychology. It's apperceptions and seeming apperceptions that are the tribunal and not impressions. Some apperceptions and seeming apperceptions, for example, I say seeming apperceptions to cover the case like in the Miller Lyre illusion, where you seem to apperceive that one bar is longer than the other. Now, in that case, you know that you're not actually apperceiving that in the success sense of apperceive. You know it's not, but an apperception is not really a belief. I know that the belief that one, I don't have the belief that one bar is longer than the other. I believe they're the same length. But I continue to seem to apperceive that one bar is longer than the other. Uh, the notion of apperception goes missing really as a byproduct of logical empiricism, a logical positivism. Ever since the logical positivists came on the scene, there's been a distinction between, on the one hand, sense impression, sense data, in the sense of or the Erlebnisse that Carnap talked about uh, in the Logische Aufbau. So there have been sense data, like to Feynorat, there's Oscar, all Oscar's sense data at time t, red star in visual field. Appropriate for Norad because he was a red. Now, 
And secondly, there have been sentences about sense data, protocol sentences. And then beliefs tend to be identified with sentences. So when, when Davidson, for example, concludes that he doesn't, doesn't think that bare sense impressions can justify anything, the only possible alternative that he sees is to say that it's sentences that, that justify other sentences. And nothing can justify a sentence but a sentence. Or to make it more psycholo less uh, linguistic or logical positive something that only beliefs can justify other beliefs. But apperceptions are not exactly beliefs because they can, or seeming apperceptions are not beliefs, but neither are they bare sense data. They are conceptualized. And I would say it's the fact that we lost the idea of a Kant who has the distinction between sensations and apperceptions argues incorrectly, I think, that we can ignore sensations which are not apperceptions because they're, quotes, nothing to us. I think that's actually a bad argument, but th that's a, a long discussion. So, mm, uh, I mean, I, I don't, and unlike McDowell, I don't believe, agree that reliabilism must be completely rejected. Secondly, I think when it comes, uh, reliabilism as a general account of justification is wrong, but when it comes to basic, percep basic perceptual judgments, like the judgment that something is read, it may be that something close to reliabilism is the best that we can do. Uh, now, the version of reliabilism that McDowell considers in mind and world is one in which impressions cause beliefs, because he is, after all, he has, after all, read Davidson, and through Davidson, read Neurath. It's a, uh, he's against a view in which impressions cause beliefs in a way that McDowell associates with bald naturalism. That is a way which is just a matter of subpersonal mechanisms and thus wholly outside of what he calls a space of reasons. I agree with McDowell that we want something at the level of interpersonal psychology, some, something more than an account of subpersonal mechanisms. Moreover, Russell's claim that we know about the table or the rabbit on the lawn by inference is simply unbelievable. If the inference is supposed, it's unbelievable if the inference is supposed to be conscious. And if it's supposed to be unconscious inference, as Helmholtz proposed, then what we have is again just a hypothesis about subpersonal mechanisms in the brain. And a hypothesis which is not particularly convincing for at least two reasons. Subpersonal mechanisms may perform syntactic operations that are at the personal level, that we at the personal level interpret as inferences, such as writing in mental ease both A and B given, uh, writing A and uh, given A and B, but writing one or two formulas given a third formula as input is not inference, it's only a syntactic representation of an inference. And two, we know now about forms of computation that don't consist of inferences in the sense of first order logic at all. There are just many more possibilities for modeling the subpersonal processes uh, involved in thought and perception than Helmholtz could have thought of. But we don't need to speculate about this. It's enough to see that a story about visual qualia causing beliefs, i.e. sentences, via unconscious mechanisms, however interesting to investigate, is not an account of perception at the level we seek. About that, McDonald is right. It's a relevant objection to one form that reliabilism can take. A perception is a phenomenon at the psychological level, the level of rational agency, and there's no reason why there shouldn't be an account of the perceptual transactions of human beings and other organisms with their environments at that level. In the human case, such an account will involve also an account of language acquisition and of the role of our linguistic abilities in that perception. A liberal functionalist, in my sense, can agree with McDowell that conceptualization plays an important role in perception in a demanding sense of perception. McDowell's mistake is to assume all experience to perception in the demanding sense. Yeah, I'm going to skip, uh, since it's getting late, I'm going to skip two sections. I'll be glad to send anyone a copy of the whole paper or if you email me uh, my account. I'm a, I use Gmail and it's just hillary.putnam at Gmail. <clears throat> and uh, remember, Hillary is spelled with one L. Okay, I have now. I want to close with some observations on the form of skepticism that pre pre preoccupies McDowell, which 
uh, has sometimes been called Kantian skepticism. It's not skepticism of the how do we know form, but, the, uh, but rather skepticism of the form, how is it possible that our thoughts have content? Jim Cohn has called this Kantian skepticism. Although a long time ago, I myself was tempted by the desire for a reductive account when I wrote the brain's understanding of its own medium of computation and representation consists in its possession of a verification of semantics for the medium, that is, of a computable predicate which can represent accessibility or warranted assertability or credibility. McDowell's work has been consistently free of all signs of such a temptation. What bothers McDowell is, is, is something else. The obvious answer to the how is it possible question if we prescind from the difficult question of reference to, un reference to unobservables, is what's your problem? Don't, you, don't we see objects in an environment all the time? Don't we touch and handle them all the time? What's the problem about how we can refer to them? But the fact that our perception of such familiar objects as apples and chairs depends on bits of sensory intake, depend, uh, that's McDowell's term, leads if we identify that sensory intake with impressions, and we identify impressions in turn with unconceptualized qualia, straight to the conclusion that the basis for all our knowledge of the external world is our qualia. And it's hard to see how they can be a basis. Where even if we don't hope for a reductive account of reference and content, it is reasonable uh, to posit that what we can conceive and what we can refer to depends at least in its initial stages on what we have cognitive contact with. And if all we have cognitive contact with in the initial stages of empirical knowledge is qualia, how do we get out of solipsism? This is a reasonable worry. Indeed, that's the worry that drove uh, analytic philosophy from Karnak's Logische Aufbau to, to Quine. And Mount McDowell's principal philosophical claim is the way to give this worry rest is to reject the idea of unconceptualized qualia altogether. They are, they are impressions, of course, he says, but they, they put us in direct contact, but they put us in direct contact with the world, and they are conceptualized. They tell us about that world. But this combination of naive realism, really naive realism, and conceptualism with respect to the phenomenal character of experience is, I think, untenable on both empirical and conceptual grounds. Uh, Hila, Hila Jacobson reviewed re the empirical evidence against the claim that all impressions are conceptualized, and I think philosophically it's also weak. McDowell is certainly right that appearing to bear presences can appear and provide an answer to the question as to how concepts and experiences are connected, or in McDowell's term, how experiences can rationally constrain beliefs. But to get to that, from that observation to the conclusion that the content of experience is conceptual, McDowell needs to assimilate sensory impressions themselves to apperceptions, and that's where we disagree. In fact, there are apperceptions that have no accompanying qualia. Uh, suppose I raise my right hand. I have an apperceptive awareness that I raised it, that, this was a that it didn't just go up, that this was a voluntary thing. But there's no quale of voluntariness. I think I remember that Elizabeth Anscombe somewhere describes this kind of awareness as knowledge without observation. But it seems to me a misdescription. I would say I did observe that I raised my hand. I raised my hand voluntarily. But this is an observation without any particular quali or qualia. Or to use a term employed by Alvin Noe, an instance of amodal awareness. Similarly, my awareness when I see a tomato, I'm seeing something which has a round other side and a soft interior. Uh, I see it that way. Uh, involves amodal awareness and not only qualia. McDowell thinks he has to say that impressions warrant beliefs, and that's the reason that he needs to reject, he needs them to be conceptually articulated. My view is that it is apperceptions that warrant beliefs. Of course, certain sorts of apperceptions are internally related to impressions, but it is the apperceptions and not the impressions that do the warranting. Babies and languageless animals do not have a perceptive awareness in the demanding Kantian or McDowellian sense, but I see no reason to deny them qualia. Of course, 
if there's a little hope of a reductive account of apperception, as there is of a reductive account of intentionality, indeed apperception involves intentionality, of course there is as little, ho as little hope of a reductive account of apperception as there is of a reductive account of intentionality, that is of reference. Indeed, apperception involves intentionality because it involves recognizing things and goings on for what they are, and recognizing involves applying concepts. Apperceiving something or event in my environment is what I've called a functional state with long arms a few minutes ago, a world involving functional state in the very liberal sense of functional state. As a liberal functional sees things, under normal conditions, neither our perceptual experience nor sentences are the beginning of the process of forming a perceptual belief. The be beginning is outside our heads. The process of forming a perceptual belief to the event that there's the effect that there's a bottle of water on this table is an exercise of a function, in fact a whole system of functions, some shaped by evolution and some by cultural processes, that connect me to objects and going-ons in my environment, in this case to the rostrum and to the bottle of water. Forming beliefs in accordance with our normal biological functions and our linguistic upbringing is not just uttering noises that are mere responses to qualia, although those qualia are part of the causal chain that connects the normal form formation of a particular perceptual belief on the basis of seeing of something to something to, to of seeing on the basis of seeing something in one's visual field on a liberal functionalist story for either our beliefs or the proto beliefs of animals and pre-linguistic children to have content is just for them to function as representations of external states of affairs. If we think of psychological states, including, importantly, apperceptions, as including objects, inputs, or otherwise non-propositional, and in important cases, not themselves mental items, then we will have to come up with a new account of representation and of transitions from inputs to representations, which is obviously a demanding project, one which perhaps will take centuries to get very far with. But we will not insist that the non-propositional and non-mental items must be conceptualized. As Steve Wagner has put my view, once we understand rational functions ecologically, we can put the state transitions inside them without facing a paradox about what objects could be doing in perception. Thank you. Hello. Yes, I want to thank Professor Putnam not only for giving us an amazing talk about perceptual experience, but in fact giving us a philosophical experience. <laughs> um, Professor Putnam will take questions outside afterwards. In order to stay on, on schedule, we'll take a break now. I just want to say one, one last thing. Um, we've seen here not only a tour de force, but a tour of philosophy full not only of wisdom, but of knowledge and of experience. And I'm reminded of a story about Dr. Josef Burg, who is one of the politicians and one of the founders of the state who served in the first 11 Knessets and knew everything there was to know about Israeli politics as part of it and as an observer of it. And on his 85th birthday, he was interviewed by a young reporter who was absolutely blown away by his knowledge and his charm and his wisdom and said that, uh, Dr. Borg, I would like to wish you uh, ask one request of you. And the request is that you will allow me to interview you on your 100th birthday. Um, to which Josef Berg replied, young man, I see no reason why not. You look perfectly healthy. <laughs> I wish us all enough good health to hear Professor Putnam and to engage in philosophy with him for many years to come. Thank, Thank you. you.